Great. I think we've still got people joining, but we will um, we will kick off with today's session um, and get started. So um, it's wonderful to see so many people um, joining today. Thank you so much for um, making time in your busy day for um, for this webinar. Um, my name is Tracy Webb. Um, I'm Associate Director at um, the Health Foundation working for the Q Initiative. I'll be kicking this off today. Um, and this workshop is the fourth in a series that we've been running on rapid learning and improvement over the last couple of months. We're really delighted to be running today's session um, in partnership with the um, with NHS Confederation and with the AHSN network as part of their reset campaign. So welcome to everybody from those organisations. We we'll look forward to um, talking more about that in a moment. I'll just start us off with a little bit of um, housekeeping, how we'll run the session today. So firstly, we will have subtitles available for anyone who needs them. So if you'd like to see subtitles, please just click on the closed caption button, um, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. We'll also add some um, instructions into the chat box now for anybody um, who needs to use that. Only one of the breakout groups will have this functionality. So if you would like to be in that group, um, please send a message to Sarah Koo. You can find her again via the chat button and she'll make sure that you are sorted on that front. If possible today, it would be really great if people could have um, their video on. Um, I know that's not always possible, but if you can, that would be great. And that's particularly helpful when we get to the breakout groups, as it'll just make it feel like uh, you're having um, a conversation together a bit, um, a bit more real, perhaps. We will be using the chat box throughout today's session, um, but there are a lot of us on the call. There's numbers are going up and up as I'm speaking. So please don't worry if you can't keep up with that. Don't feel you need to monitor it um, if you find that distracting. Um, we will um, analyse the chat at the end and we'll, and we'll write, um, we'll include in the write-up um, any information from chat that we think would be um, of interest when we publish that in a couple of weeks' time. Our write-ups also include a full copy of the slide, um, slides that we use, as well as a synthesis of what we've discussed. So you'll have all of that available to you after the meeting. So by way of getting to know your host a little bit and a bit about the context of the workshop, I'm just going to start off by saying a few words about the Health Foundation's Q community. And then I'll invite Rory from NHS Confederation to share a little bit about the Confed Reset campaign. So a number of you on the call today are Q members. Um, so feel free to introduce yourselves via chat if you'd like to. But for those of you who don't know, Q community is a network of just over three and a half thousand people who work across the UK and Ireland to improve health and care. Um, Q is a membership organisation, but it's free to join. It's led by the Health Foundation and it's run in partnership with um, organisations and partners across the UK and Ireland. I'll say a little bit about what Q is. Um, it's, it's quite bold in its scale. Um, we, we have thousands of members and we offer a range of opportunities from large scale networking opportunities to learning and development packages to grant funding offers specifically for um, Q members and their organisations. We operate across the UK and Ireland to support people to learn and share um, good practice across the board. Q has one simple aim. Um, we want to make it easier for people to share, learn and collaborate because we think that that's key to accelerating the positive impacts that we can have in the health and care system. Um, we do make lots of our resources available for anyone and certainly all of the work that we've been doing and have, since, um, since COVID we've made open source so absolutely anyone can access them whether you're a member or otherwise um, via our website. Um, but there are a range of opportunities as well available just for members. Um, if you'd like to find That's, out a little bit more, <laughs> I think I think somebody, sorry, I think somebody's not muted. Um, if you've just joined, if you can mute, that would be fantastic. Um, so yeah, uh, if you'd like to find out any more about how you can join Q and what it might offer um, you, please do check out the website um, or look for us on Twitter. That's all I'm going to say about Q for now. I'm now going to hand over to um, Rory Dayton, um, uh, who's going to say a few words about NHS uh, Confed's reset campaign. Thanks, Tracy. So I'm just going to speak for uh, three or four minutes on our reset campaign. And we share um, the, the, the view of the World Economic Forum that there is a, an opportunity, there is a narrow window of opportunity in which to 
uh, reset the way that we think about health and care services. Basically, do the next slide. And if you click through the whole slide, Tracy, so we think there's an opportunity to influence at the moment. It probably didn't exist five months ago. Our members and stakeholders have talked about an experience of COVID that has been traumatic, but has also been transformative. And there is a real appetite to change the way they think and commission and deliver and organise health and care services. They want more than just recovering back to the same old NHS. And they would like a reset to a new way of working and thinking. So reset for us is about the public debate on what the health and care system could look like in the future. And then it'll be a piece of work that we will be supporting, looking to try and influence um, our partners in, in government and uh, in NHSEI to, to, to change the way that we think about health and care services. And it splits up into 10 themes, Tracy. Um, very, very briefly, we, we lead with a focus on our health and care workforce, recognising the enormous sacrifices that have been made and the need to protect them. Um, we have a really strong focus on health inequalities and I think our leaders um, throughout the crisis, the, the profile of health inequalities, the disp disproportionate way that uh, COVID has impacted on the poor parts of our community um, has been really significant. So, so we're looking for an increased um, uh, in focus on health inequalities in the future. We're really aware of the mental health surge that we're expecting to come out as we move out of the first phase um, of the um, of, of lockdown and we're really nervous about what a second phase might do for uh, the mental health of particularly of, of young people but for a wide range of people. Um, uh, we, we we're looking at ways that we can retain the lean light and agile governance culture that developed over the last five months. Uh, how do we push back on unnecessary assurance and how can we create um, an environment that keeps people safe and keeps patients safe but actually uh, enables us to innovate and change services at pace. We're really interested in the way that uh, we're rolling back uh, NHS services and the difficult decisions that are being made in organisations about how you keep people safe in, in a, in a, a, alongside delivering COVID services. We've got an enormous focus on uh, integration and, and whole system working. Um, and I think we found that where partnership working was good and integration was good, it's now better as a result of the last five months and where relationships didn't exist before, they, they do now. So at all levels, we're looking to maintain that and support a change in the, the architecture for the NHS that supports um, uh, integration and partnership working. And just the last slide, if that's okay. Um, we've also got to focus on uh, economic and social recovery as we move towards the deepest recession that we will perhaps see for 300 years. The NHS has a role to play in that economic and social recovery. And there was a really excellent report that came out of West Yorkshire um, that you may have seen yesterday that supports that idea. We're working in partnership with the Academic Health Science Network and the Health Foundation to share innovation and best practice. We're also looking at social care. And again, the pandemic has shown the critical importance of social care alongside NHS services. And lastly, we're looking at um, the relationship the NHS has developed with our communities over the last five months. And we have a, a slightly different relationship than we perhaps have had before, where we've worked in partnership with people, with families, with communities uh, to keep people safe. And we're interested in whether we can develop that narrative about our relationship with patients, people, families, being more of a partnership and less of a transactional relationship. So that's what our, our reset campaign is all about. Uh, in terms of timescales, we have spent uh, uh, most of June and July listening to uh, our partners and our stakeholders and our members' views. We're looking to put together a set of uh, key themes and asks that we'll be putting through during August and looking to produce some, uh, find some final outcomes uh, uh, by about September. Thank you very much, Tracy. Lovely. Thank you, Rory. That's a um, really great overview of the um, really important work that um, you guys are doing through the Reset campaign. 
Um, and I guess drawing on that theme um, that Rory's talked about there of learning about what has worked well, today's workshop has been designed to support you to um, identify and understand some of the conditions and the ways of working that have enabled innovation to thrive over recent weeks and months and to kind of make sense of what's needed now and in the coming months to sustain this. Obviously, um, through the tragedy that, that is COVID-19, we all hope that some good will emerge, whether that's at global, societal or individual level. And we've certainly seen that in health and care, there's real opportunity and such an impressive appetite to explore the changes that have taken place um, in the first months of responding to COVID, um, understand which of those has been positive and for whom, and to draw lessons and learning for the future. The agenda today then, I've uh, we'll just set out briefly here. So during today's session, you'll be hearing from two fantastic leaders um, who are working within the system, John Siddle from Southwest AHSN and Dominique Bird from Improvement Cymru, will share their experience of working across the system to identify and embed some of these positive changes. You'll have some space to reflect on both their experiences and of course your own and gather some real life ideas and inspiration from um, peers that you'll be talking to that you can hopefully take back to your organisations and systems, as well as having an opportunity to connect with people um, during the call today. Just very briefly, we're going to start off um, with um, a quick play with some of the interactive elements of the workshop. So this will just allow us to test uh, the use of the chat box uh, via a very short icebreaker. Um, so just over the course of the next 60 seconds or so, if you could um, bring up the chat box and respond to the following questions. The first one is, today I am feeling. We'll pop that question in chat as well. And as I said before, I don't think that you can read all of these as they come, but you'll get a flavour of them kind of swimming past your, swimming past your eyes. Um, lovely. I'll move on to the next one, but keep going as, 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 you, as you wish. Um, the next question I'd like to pose is, I hope this workshop will. Oh, lots of call for inspiration. <laughs> Hopefully we can, we can meet that learning, inspiring, space for reflection, good ideas, fantastic. And then the last one, um, it's a bit more of a, a lighthearted one perhaps, or perhaps something a bit deeper for you. The thing that has got me through lockdown has been, I make a vote for chocolate, but I hope maybe you've all had different things. Garden, yeah. Sunshine, we have been lucky. <laughs> New baby, gosh, congratulations, whoever that was. <gasps> Lovely. Great, well, I hope that was, um, yeah, uh, uh, a bit of an icebreaker, get to know some of, some of your colleagues on the call and um, get used to using, um, using chat. Thank you. Cool, so I'm going to um, take over just for a few moments. Um, my name is Libby and I'm the head of the QLabs network. And um, before we get going into some of the, the bigger parts of the session, I'm just going to give you a bit of information now about different ways to approach learning practices within your teams and organisations. Now we know, as we've heard already at the beginning of this session, how important it's going to be to pay attention to the innovations that are taking place, but also how hard it can be to give that the headspace that it needs right now. So this workshop series that we've been running for the last few months has provided a mixture of theory and activities designed to support people to develop their learning practices, focusing on tools and methods that are easy to pick up, are collaborative and practical. And as we know, quite a few people are joining us today for the first time. I'm going to give a really quick recap of some of the basics of this now. And for anyone who's been at sessions already, please do use the chat box to share some of your experiences. Now, broadly speaking, when we're talking about learning in this context, we're referring to the process for recognising and recording insights and being able to use and interrogate these through social processes to draw conclusions and move to action. And really importantly, learning of, of this type is going to be more effective if it's done by teams than by individuals. Now, Peter Senge in his book, The Fifth Discipline, talks really eloquently about how, how learning can become a team skill. And he believes this is our uh, most helpful mechanism if we're going to transform and adapt to what's needed in a dynamic world. So it's really relevant for the context we find ourselves in now. In terms of what to consider, there's just six um, principles that I will briefly highlight. The first of these is to avoid jumping to conclusions. 
Now, it can be incredibly easy to make assumptions, particularly when we are busy or stressed. And our brains are really helpfully designed to identify and spot patterns to make it easier for us to process the world. But when it comes to learning, it can mean that we misinterpret what's happening around us and spot patterns that may not be there. Now, a tool that we found really helpful to try and explain and address this is the ladder of inference developed by Chris Argyris and popularised by Senge. And a really good learning process should help you to move up each stage of this ladder run by one rather than jumping kind of straight to the middle or even from the bottom to the top. And we're going to revisit this concept in the breakout session that we've got a bit later in the session. The second principle is to be purposeful. So there's an infinite number of things you could be paying attention to, particularly right now. So you've got to be very clear about what your goals are and what it's most important for you to be learning from and what's feasible with your resources. Now, if you're really interested at the moment about kind of how you're making sense of the changes that you've implemented during COVID and what this means for the future, you may want to look at this model developed by the RSA which splits activities into things that have stopped that you can let go of, things that have been paused that will need to be restarted, temporary measures that will come to an end, and new innovations that you should be thinking to amplify. And this is a really nice, simple way to focus on what's been working and what may be able to last from the changes that you've been seeing recently. The third principle is to be timely. So it's important that you capture learning as you go as much as possible. And there's some really fantastic tools that have been developed during COVID that you can borrow from and adapt to your context. I've just put on the screen here two of the most popular ones, um, a quality impact assessment tool from ELF and a learning framework developed by Collaborate CRC. And both of these are definitely worth a look if you haven't seen them already. The next principle is to involve diverse perspectives in the way that you collect data and analyse it. So look for tools and methods that will support a range of people to participate. The more you can get diverse people involved, the better place you will be to make decisions. So choose tools that are easily accessible and work well for groups. Also think about when groups are already meeting and see if you can use that as a space for learning conversations. Participants in these sessions have spoken about using existing team meetings or huddles, letting people share feedback and WhatsApp groups and taking advantage of existing virtual platforms that they know people are on. And all of this is really helpful if you're thinking about um, doing this in a timely way. The fifth principle is to support psychological safety, because of course safety goes completely hand in hand with the team's ability to learn. If someone doesn't feel safe, they're not going to be able to speak up. IHI have produced a really great piece about what to say and do during the pandemic, and it highlights some behaviours that you can model to demonstrate that all voices are valued. They pose some really nice example questions that you may want to use, and a few of these are just pulled out on the slide. The final principle is to focus on what is enabling the change to happen. Some of the most significant changes we've seen in the last few months have been behavioural and cultural. For example, a renewed um, sense of shared purpose across the system, a willingness to try new things, and a greater sense of permission and autonomy from frontline teams to implement change. And if we can hold on to some of these changes, it could be an incredible legacy from COVID. It's important here to think about the changes that you're seeing and the patterns and systems that may be causing that to happen. A model that we've used in these sessions to support conversation is the iceberg, to help you think about the structures and mental models that underpin some of the events that you're seeing. I hope this has been a useful, very quick whistle-stop tour of a few principles that you may want to be thinking about in this session and in your conversations within your organisations. We'll of course be sharing links and references if you'd like to explore this more after. And we're now going to be hearing from two speakers talking about their experiences of learning during COVID. We'll have about 10 minutes for each presenter and um, in that time please do feel free to use the chat box if there's particular questions that you'd like to pose to them. We hope we'll have some time for Q&A at the end and if not we'll definitely respond to the questions in our write-up for the session. Now, I will begin by introducing John Siddle. So John is Chief Exec for Southwest AHSM. And he's going to be talking about some of the really fantastic work they've been doing in Cornwall and Devon to capture learning during COVID. It's over to you, John. Great, thanks, Libby. And can you hear me all right before I get going? Yeah, perfect. Very good. Well, uh, thanks uh, to Tracy, Libby, and team for inviting us today. I thought I'd use the next 10 minutes to uh, do three things. So, firstly, I'm going to share a bit about the approach we're using across the network of AHSNs that uh, we heard Rory talk about earlier on around how we're thinking about innovation in the context of COVID-19. 
I'm then going to dive into our work locally and some of the findings from our rapid learning work around the conditions for rapid change and what we've observed uh, across, across our region. Uh, and then a little bit about how we're trying to use some of that learning to help inform the future of the work locally really and how we might hold on to some of those conditions. So uh, thanks for moving forward with the slides. I'll try and uh, try and prompt for that as we go through. But starting then with uh, our work as the AHSN network and our involvement in, uh, in, in COVID and the reset activity. So uh, I'm sure most of you are aware, um, it's, we're one of 15 AHSNs, uh, that, that red uh, part of the map down in the southwest corner uh, of England, set up by NHS England all the way back in 2013 with the aim of spreading innovative practice across the health and care system with the aim of improving population health and generating economic growth. So we do that by working together as a national network of AHSNs to achieve those aims, by working across the boundaries of the health and care system, so public, commercial, academic and community sectors, but really importantly, working at different geographical scales within that system as well. So from working deeply in local systems through to regional and national level work as well. And all of that is based on very deeply rooted connections within uh, uh, the local systems that we each uh, are part of. So as part of that work, we've recently formed this partnership with the Health Foundation and Confed as part of the wider NHS Reset campaign. And through that partnership, we're trying to really use the knowledge, connections and experience AHSNs have been gaining uh, through their involvement with local partners across, across different regions to help inform where we go next. So three uh, broad components of that work is firstly to uh, to bring together a lot of the fantastic rapid learning that's been taking place both within AHSNs and within their networks over the last few months and to try and really capture both local and national responses and using that to both inform the future which I'll come on to in a moment but also to, to very immediately inform feedback loops in how we're trying to improve those immediate responses to some of the challenges we've faced over the last uh, the last few months. We're also then diving deeper into specific evaluation and learning around key changes that have taken place to try and capture the learning of what's happened, identify good practice and, and ultimately try and uh, work out what we really want to hold on to as systems both at a local uh, and, a, and a national level as well. Then we're using that work then to try and inform both local, uh, regional and national recovery plans to help support then our partners across uh, across the country to help sustain and spread some of the really positive changes that have taken place. So that, uh, that top right hand corner of Ian Burbridge's model uh, that, that Libby mentioned earlier on. And all through that work, I think, I guess a theme that, that, that passes through all of it is seeking to really embed the features of a resilient health and care system, which is getting into not just what has changed, uh, but very much the how of what's changed as well. So if we move on to the next slide, um, I, I, I'm going to briefly take you through what we've observed so far is these eight main conditions which kind of get into the why and the how of why we think some of the rapid change uh, has has been able to take place and so I'm, I'm not going to be able to take you through all of these so I'll focus on a few of them but but it's very typical to the approach that we take in looking at how we spread innovative practice across across health and care systems and again referring to that iceberg model which we're big fans of Libby so thank, thanks for mentioning that in your introduction. So we're looking there in that to try and identify what are the leverage points for change where we can get below the water and into some of those uh, underlying reasons for why things are happening so in behaviours and system structures and mental models of the way people work and if we can shift those perhaps we can then create the environment um, for, for what has happened so far and use that as a way of understanding how we can create more uh, the more desired events and changes to take place in the future as well. So our, our work that we've done so far, and this is thanks to all the team's work uh, over the last couple of months uh, unpicking some of this, is has identified eight main conditions that we've observed uh, that are on, are, are on the slide here. And um, so that's things like shared purpose around how we communicate, the adaptability of the way people have worked, the way things have been resourced, uh, and a sense of permission and psychological safety as we heard about before. So my personal reflection before I dive into any of these specifically is uh, I don't think any of these are particularly new. Uh, I've been working in and around trying to influence complex systems for, for several years now and I think we've known these are the things we need to try and achieve, the conditions that make it possible. But as we've seen from uh, some of Mary Yorbin's work in, in the US recently, she kind of talks about this sense of uh, we have this adaptive space right now where we're seeing these conditions come to life in practice. And I think that's certainly what we've seen 
through some of our work getting quite deep into the ground of what's what's happening uh, in practice in, in in our region as well. So I'm going to focus on three uh, and try and pull out what we've observed of why these conditions have helped to enable change and what that really looks like in practice. So if we could go forward to the next one please. So the first of these is the the importance of a single shared purpose and that's played out obviously at a national level with a very shared uh, focus and purpose around COVID-19 more broadly but very specifically is playing out locally as well and how change is happening on the ground. So it's helping people to uh, create real sense of focus across organizations on a specific change that we're trying to make happen. Uh, and what that we've seen that do is help to remove some of the many and multiple conflicting priorities that we all face when we're trying to make any change happen uh, within our roles across a health and care system. Uh, and what this has really said is this is the thing that we're doing right now. Let's, let's do this thing if we don't do anything else and do it really well. And that's helped to also then bring others on board with that kind of sense of a single compelling aim for what it is we're trying to achieve. So what that looked like in practice, a couple of examples that I'll draw on from the right hand side of the slide there. So the first one is what I'm sure many of you have been involved in or will be familiar with, which is the work around video consultation between primary care and care homes, where we've seen a significant increase in capacity of what the number of patients GPs have been able to see in inverted commas, uh, saving travel time, creating some real opportunities for increasing capacity whilst reducing physical interactions. And for us, that, that kind of shared goal of uh, a, a sense of we have to find a way of maintaining quality of care and also reducing physical interactions. How do we do that was the underlying shared goal that helps uh, people working from different parts of a system to overcome some of the technical, behavioural, cultural barriers uh, and make this really happen very quickly in practice and seeing a shared benefit and shared value. Uh, across across each each part of, uh, of of those partnerships involved, the second example then was uh, community responses to uh, how communities have come together around COVID nineteen. Uh, particularly drawing out an example from One Alpha Cream, which is uh, one of the partners we've been working with for quite a while now around social prescribing more broadly, but have been looking a bit more deeply into what's been happening there around their work around COVID-19. And there's a case study on our website and blog about this if anyone's interested in going a bit deeper, but broadly what we observed there was a huge increase in a coordinated volunteer-led uh, response to supporting vulnerable groups. And, and what we saw is the real importance and value of shared purpose in helping make that happen. So a real clarity of focus on what it was we were trying to achieve, how we were trying to achieve that and bringing everyone together around that. So that's the, the first condition I thought I'd, uh, I'd go into in a bit more detail. Second one then, if we go through to the next slide, uh, which we've heard about a little already today, is that importance of permission uh, and creating the psychological safety uh, in the organisations, teams and, and, and systems that we're working to make that happen. And that's helped us to try things out uh, very quickly, to fail first and try again and, and to do that first. And uh, what that has looked like example in, in, in practice, sorry, a couple, of, a couple of examples then. So uh, it's been really interesting to see the rapid development of community treatment units. Uh, so the CATA units that we've seen in parts of our region, which are looking at assessing and treating people with high frailty index to avoid acute admissions. And, you know, a lot of this stuff was in the pipeline and planned to make happen, but we've seen that really accelerate as a product of COVID with the permission across the system, I guess, across partners that need to be involved in that to prioritise this, to focus on it, to work together, combine existing resources uh, and make it happen. And, and also to be comfortable and tolerating that we might not get it right first time and using improvement cycles to try and drive that sense of rapid learning rapid improvement to try and try and make it make it work in practice. Another example where we've seen that permission given to experiment and try to do things differently in response to a very immediate need has been how we've seen the uh, shifts and changes around uh, around primary care network contracts and giving practices and groups of practices the permissions to to try different approaches to develop those responses quickly repurpose existing resource that was originally planned for other activity and to be paid on account to help stabilize practice cash flows uh, and get them busy with doing what was was necessary so some really practical i guess changes to contractual structures that have to also given the permission as well as the more cultural permission to do that that we've seen in other examples then the final example i, I thought i'd draw on is the importance of cross organizational systems to make this all work 
And this is really about, I guess, the underlying ways of bringing together data systems and structures to help make change happen quickly uh, and help to learn from that change at pace as well. So two examples I'll draw on here. The first is the Embrace programme in Cornwall, which is a new model of intermediate care, again, planned in the pipeline to be done uh, in, in the region, but, but not necessarily uh, expected to accelerate in the way it did over the last few months. And, and ultimately what they're trying to do with this work is to have a single referral platform and an electronic referral form that goes straight into a dedicated multi multidisciplinary team to handle those responses set up through a number of community coordination centers. And we saw that happen very quickly and really the underlying platforms and electronic referral forms that enabled that to happen meant the pace in which that could, could happen in practice uh, was really accelerated, combined of course with the interconnection with many of the other conditions that, that I talked about earlier on as well. Then the, the, the final example is the work we've seen around social prescribing test beds. So uh, we've worked with a number of test bed sites across the Southwest as part of our Institute for Social Prescribing over the last year or two. Uh, and what we've seen, which has been really exciting during COVID is how some of those barriers to sharing information across different parts of the system, particularly across health, social care and the community sector has enabled uh, multiple different parts of the system to come together uh, to support shielded groups uh, across the community and, and the, the pace in which it was possible to accelerate that work and the quality of that work as a product of having that shared information being being really critical. So hopefully that gives you a sense of some examples of what we've seen and how those conditions are playing out in practice. If we just move on to the final slide then please. Um, there we go. Uh, I thought I'd finish with the question that we're asking ourselves right now which is how do we help our partners across the region? And I, I know other AHSNs thinking about this and their partners across other regions hold on to some of these conditions for the future. So one example where we're looking at that is how we're uh, looking at adapting something we've been planning for a while now with our partners across Devon around a change hub that seeks to try and sustain and spread innovative practice across the system. So the way we're now approaching that is trying to apply some of these conditions into practice within that Change Hub project and that Change Hub program. So we're looking at a small number of very focused projects that look to try and respond to system level issues where we can see a shared purpose and a shared value in those issues to make sure leaders across the system are then giving permission to teams to focus on those very specific issues and work across boundaries and combine resources to do that and then broadly giving the underlying resources, systems, and ability to make that happen in practice. So, uh, so that's something we're trying as a mechanism to try and hold on to some of this. I know other AHSNs are experimenting with similar approaches as well, uh, but we'll keep, keep people posted, posted on how that evolves. So then to finish, um, I hope that's been useful. Uh, in the final slide there, I've added a few resources that might be of use. So a bit more detail on the NHS Reset campaign with the HSN network and that specific focus around best practice and innovation. Uh, some of the blogs I've mentioned on virtual consultations in care homes uh, and some of the work around one health home and community responses to, to COVID. Um, and I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to share some of this. It's very live. Um, we certainly don't think it's perfect or exactly representative of everything that's been going on, but hopefully a helpful prompt for our discussions later on today. And I look forward to joining the breakout discussions. Thanks, Sylvie. Lovely. Thank you so much, Don. That was um, really great and really great to have some of those kind of principles highlighted um, with, with the examples that, that you gave. So thank you. Um, I'm now going to introduce um, Dominique Bird, who's Head of Capacity and Capability at Improvement Cymru. And we're going to run this session um, as an interview to move away from slides for, um, for a moment. So I'll be asking Dom a few questions um, uh, and she'll be responding and hopefully you'll be able to see her fine. Um, so Dom, um, if you're happy, we will, um, we will kick off. And maybe just to start with, if you could tell us a little bit about you and the work that you do within, um, within Improvement Cymru, maybe a tiny bit about how that's changed since COVID. Yeah, sure. So, um, hi everyone. I'm Head of Capacity and Capability in Improvement Cymru and Improvement Cymru is the National Improvement Support Body for NHS Wales. Um, my role is largely focused on developing capability, creating those connections and supporting, if you like, the creation of some of the conditions for improvement within that system. So, 
Um, easy job. <laughs> Within my remit though, um, I lead the Improvement Cymru Academy, which focuses on levels of improvement skill building. Um, the Q Network Wales, so Q Cymru, and um, also the development of a very exciting Q Lab Cymru, which will be launching later this year. Um, I also cover the analytics function, so we have program analytics support, but also predictive modelling um, and strategic analy analytics to inform our priorities. Um, and our communications function, which looks at a lot of behavioural change approaches to support improvement um, and events as well. So how that has changed? Well, Improvement Cymru is part of Public Health Wales. And so during the last four to five months, there's been some major redeployments of our team. Um, largely, our team have been focused on testing, sampling and the results aspects of COVID support across Wales. Um, our communications team has been focused on using their behaviour change campaigns for improvement and, and so they've been leading a campaign called How Are You Doing? which launched a, a couple of months ago uh, for mental health and wellbeing support during COVID. And our analytics function has been obviously supporting modelling a lot of the testing sites, locations, but also um, some of the turnaround times and other aspects to inform improvements across, across that process. As everyone else, our events and academy are looking at how do we uh, turn everything to much more virtual approaches to encourage learning, skill building and collaborative working. Um, and I think fundamentally our whole team were put in completely new situations and services that they were completely unfamiliar with, but their ad adaptability was absolutely incredible. And I, I have reflected on that thinking, a lot of that comes from the strength of, of an improvement background. Um, if we think back to the core sets of the habits of an improver, I think that learning, influencing, resilience, creativity and systems thinking, those are the key elements that I think we needed within the pandemic um, across, across the UK, obviously, and across the world. But these were clearly demonstrated um, by our team across all their COVID response work. It is shifting now. Um, so we are looking at how we start up some of our program areas um, but, and how best we support the services in this, in this new world. So really interested to hear of the other speakers of, of how they're, they're embarking on those aspects. Lovely. Thanks, Dom. Um, Dom, one thing that would be interesting to explore with you, we've touched on this already um, in the workshop, that a number of people have noticed that the pandemic has kind of broken down silos that have long existed between organisations and sectors. I'd just be interested in your experience of this, um, this in Wales and what we can learn from the pandemic about what it takes to deliver integrated, uh, joined up care in that way. Okay, thanks, Tracy. Um, this, this is something that I think Tracy and I have had a chat about on a number of occasions. I've witnessed this at, at an internal level as well as at a systems level in, in Wales. I think um, Improvement Cymru historically is we've delivered national programmes and we've had some commissioned by different policy departments within Welsh Government or even um, commissioned by chief executives um, directly. And sometimes we've had programmes therefore delivering in silos, focusing on, if you like, their piece of the puzzle. And we've been trying to shift that to a much more systems view, um, but for a number for for a while really. And I think that commissioning aspect and the and sometimes they are quite differing and and conflicting priorities um, has almost reinforced that way of working. I think um, as as and many of you will reflect, something has been unlocked by by this pandemic and the approach that teams have had to take. Um, a lot of our teams are taking the time to look around and to talk to and work with people that they've never worked with closely before. Um, and even the time to think, even during um, the pandemic. So I think we've seen a lot more creativity, um, both within our team, but also across the system and a much more systems approach with major linkages being created by the teams across our programmes. I think um, across our system, if you like in Wales, um, as uh, other speakers have mentioned, there's much more joined up work in. I think that shared purpose has really um, come into focus uh, between acute primary and ambulance services, for example. We've um, increased the use of Consultant Connect virtual consultations as, as well, um, but also across different sectors. Um, we've had a number of partnering op opportunities, one in particular to support more vulnerable areas um, during the the uh, the midst of the pandemic in Wales and the lockdown, the um, 
Age Cymru, Social Care Wales, Welsh Government, Digital Wales and ourselves came together to um, start up a thing called Digital Care Home Kutch. To that, so that is within our team supported by mental health, our care homes team, our unscheduled care team as well, and provides that peer network support on a virtual basis for care homes. Uh, initially, it was about supporting them to make sense of some of that complicated guidance and information during COVID um, and trying to help them uh, lead them through some of that, those conflicting messages um, and, and linked obviously to the testing approach. But actually, we're now looking, it's evolving into something that's much more focused on patient safety, person centred care, digital skills as well and improvement skills building. So I, th I think that's one, one aspect that we're really keen to hold on to and how do we how do we maintain those partnerships? I think um, in terms of those enablers, if you like, underpinning that, um, the two aspects I, I've mentioned before, I think I go back to is that systems view and creativity. Um, I think traditionally, we probably need some space from some of those traditional structures for that to happen. So I've mentioned this commissioning bit, but also in terms of reporting routes and sometimes even just the meetings that we create, we build boundaries around those meetings and the the names that we give programs, for example, and we, we often create those um, abnormal boundaries um, and keep teams in their silos. I think all the research we've done with improvement communities in Wales historically has identified time and time again that the two things you need for improvement are time and space. I think the pandemic has shown that it can be done in little time, but I think it's the space that we need and that space is more about support from leaders to look at those connections and systems and, uh, and be creative as well and to, to support others being creative. I think, sorry okay. Trace, I'm just, just thinking, I, th I think with COVID, we, no one had the answers. Um, we had a number of issues and we'd all explored them together. Um, and I think e even though the system has often talked about enabling and engaging the workforce, we, we tend to revert to giving preconceived answers to implement. So I think the best system thinkers are those in the system. They, they see how it works or doesn't work. And I think, I think as leaders, we need to be brave and support them to explore it and be more creative. Thank you. Dom, there's so much in your answers that I want to like pick your brains about <laughs> and, pull, and draw out. Um, I'm only disappointed we're constrained by time. I'm going to ask you one final question, if I may. Uh, we haven't got too much time, but just your quick reflections. I guess um, lots of what you've said have been really struck by um, what you've talked about. The, this, the teams who are adapting, changing, developing new skills, operating at pace. And, and we know that lots of people working in this sector are under huge kind of pressure um, and, and there will be a long term impact on people's kind of resilience and well-being. And I just wondered if you could tell us briefly sort of some of what you've been thinking about that kind of well-being side of things and how we support one another through the next phase, whatever that may hold. Yeah, definitely. I think this is something we all need to be completely mindful across, as you say, across society. The pressure of this pandemic is placed on all of our mental health and well-being is, is I, I think, is unknown, to be honest. I think at the beginning of the pandemic, I heard the phrase quite often that this is a marathon, not a sprint. But then we had teams sprinting a marathon. Um, and I think now with kind of the, the backlog of planned care, for example, and other pressures, we can't expect one of those marathon sprinters to just keep going. Um, we've used an approach in our team to create moments of reflection I, and I think that's absolutely essential here is how do we create those moments um, to give people the time to just stop and reflect um, and surface some of that learning so what we what we've approached it is with a collation of COVID stories so we had 300 words or a picture or even a Lego build um, to sort of reflect your COVID experience and some of those are incredibly humbling um, very personal um, and they capture not only the impact on working life, but obviously home life that this made as well. But a large proportion of the team have, have said how cathartic they found that approach. And the more stories that we've captured and, and shared, the more that have come forward and shared their stories. Um, I think there's a huge amount of resources that have been made available across the UK, where uh, Public Health Wales have been working on a number of resources to support resilience and well-being. I mentioned the How You're Doing campaign, and we're shortly about to launch activate your life which is an online general population course um, but uh, one of one of the key aspects i think is how do we create those moments of reflection and, and as a team and we're supporting some of our health board colleagues in this as well 
is how do we create those feedback loops using things like Improve Well app, which is what we've been testing out. Um, but how do we do those ongoing? It's not just a reflect and then move on. It needs to be continual. So be looking at those stories again and capturing where people are and how they're reflecting in the next three months. It's a habit I think we need to, to build in, I think, um, and we need to create that. Um, but I think I'll finish there, I think, uh, Tracy, with the, with the words of one of, one of our uh, teams. I came across her out of office the other day and I think it perfectly sums it up. So this is, I will give a shout out to her, Sarah James. And on her out of office, she wrote, be kind to yourself, appreciate someone around you and know that who you are and what you do matters. And I think that struck quite a few people. So I think I'll leave it there. Thanks, Trace. Thank you so much, uh, John, and a perfect way to bring that session to um, a close. Um, and thanks also to John. Um, both of you shared some really, um, really insightful um, uh, stories and, and insights there. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. Um, there's been some great conversation in chat. Please do keep that going. Um, not least a conversation sparked by Trevor around public and patient involvement. Um, we'll try and pick those up. Um, uh, with, with the speakers afterwards and, and share some of our answers and, and include it in the write-up. But I'm now going to hand over to, um, to Libby, who's going to take us through the next part of the session. Thank you. Cool, thanks Tracy. And thank you so much to, to John and Dom for your sharing. It was incredibly interesting to hear some of your experiences. Now, I'm sure if you're anything like me, your head is going to be kind of buzzing from what we've just been hearing. Um, so what we're going to be doing now is moving into some smaller group conversations to process some of our thoughts collectively and hopefully um, turn some of this into potential action. Um, now, we're going to be using a liberating structures activity called What, So What, Now What? And this is particularly helpful to help um, groups of people reflect on a shared experience to build understanding and encourage action. And we know it's um, been really popular with a number of key members during the pandemic. I guess the benefit of asking these questions in this order is it allows you to slowly move up, move up the ladder of inference that I mentioned a bit earlier. We will be slightly adapting the version just to make it fit in the time that we've got available. So we're going to start with individual reflection and then we'll move into group conversation. So to begin, I would like you to just take um, a couple of minutes now to think about what you've taken away from the conversation that we've just heard. Particularly ask, answering what facts or observations have stood out for you in what you've just heard. I will give you about 60 seconds for this and we'll let you know when that time is up. And now we need to think a bit more about the so what question. So what are some of the impl um, implications of the things that you've just been noting down? Why is this important and what meaning can you draw from this? I will give you another kind of 45 seconds for this one. Okay, now I hope that very brief interlude has given you just a few minutes to get some of your thoughts in order. We're now going to move into our um, small group conversations. And an important thing to note here is that some groups are going to have a pre-assigned host, but the majority of groups won't do. So you will need to self-facilitate some degree for this activity. I promise it is very straightforward. I will um, briefly describe some instructions. But the most important thing for you to be doing as a host is keeping an eye on time and ensuring that everyone in your group can contribute. Now, in terms of instructions, it's, as I say, very straightforward. So we'll begin by each person in your group having kind of 60 to 90 seconds in turn to introduce themselves and share what has stood out for them in the conversation. 
You've then got about 10 minutes for a group conversation to delve deeper and discuss any patterns or themes that are coming out. And the last step is that each person has one minute to share what they're taking away from the conversation and the action they may plan to take. Now we'll be posting these instructions in the chat box now. You can also take a photo of your screen if you'd like to have that as a helpful reminder. If you have any issues in the session, um, you can click on the Ask for Help button at the bottom and you can choose the option of bringing um, one of the hosts to your group. And as a reminder as well, if you would like to have subtitles for this session, please make sure you come back to the main room as that's where we'll be providing this functionality. So yeah, I hope that you enjoyed that time. It, as I was just saying, it often does feel like you could do with more, more time in breakout rooms, but hopefully you had a good chance to start to explore and develop some of your thinking together. Um, and you, know, you may have made connections that you can follow up on after today's webinar. Unfortunately, again, there's too many of us for us to share back in plenary what, um, what we discussed. But if you do have any reflections that you'd like to share from your conversation or indeed from the, the process that we use, the liberating structure um, that we use, please do feel free to use the chat function um, and follow up with people. We'll now move on to, um, to the next section um, of the webinar and, and all of this builds, builds on each other. I'm sure some of you will have got into in your conversation some of the risks for the future. I think one of the things that has felt most inspiring about talking to um, people who are working in the health and care sector during COVID has been the sort of the levels of resilience and optimism that so many people have demonstrated. And indeed, during this workshop um, and in many other spaces, people have been talking about the opportunities that we have as we come out of this most acute phase um, of responding to the crisis to build a kind of new normal, um, if you like, and learn from, uh, learn from the experience that we've had. And it feels right, of course, to harness this energy and positivity for change. But an important um, aspect of the conversation is also the kind of risks or the traps that we might each fall into as we try to build this uh, new normal. So I'm just going to take a few moments now to draw out three of the key risks that have emerged from the conversations we've been having through Q um, and with practitioners across, across the system. Um, and then we'll have a little bit more of um, kind of sharing um, um, interactively. So the first that I'd like to draw out is silos. And we have touched on this already today. But at the beginning of the crisis, there was a really palpable sense amongst um, health and care professionals and those working um, to improve health and care of kind of all being in it together. Um, I remember in one of the first workshops that we run, uh, I talked to a GP in Scotland, who talked really openly and honestly about working with system managers and system leaders during this time and how impressed she was at their dedication and their passion and how much that they enabled her to do her job um, as, a, as a GP. And previously, she said it felt like they just operated in, in somewhat different worlds. She didn't really know what they did, and it certainly didn't feel like they were working towards the same goal. But COVID just shifted that. And of course, it's not just about individuals. We've heard about barriers that have been broken down across organisations and systems. Things that had previously taken months to degree had been signed off and set up within a matter of days. But I think it's fair to say that in the last few weeks, it feels like some of those newfound relationships, some of that sense of togetherness has started in some instances to slightly weaken. In an odd way, the immediate pressures of COVID had a, something of a system simplifying effect. But now as the system becomes more complex and multifaceted again, some of the silos are re-emerging and shared purpose is being stretched by professional and organisational viewpoints. It feels really vital to identify and build on the bonds that began to form um, during that time. We spent a lot of time talking about that in our breakout um, and mitigate the risks of silos re-emerging. The second risk I'd like to touch on, sorry, um, just if you could all mute, that would be really great because there's a bit of background noise. Um, the second risk I'd like to draw out is a focus on the, the kind of what, um, what the innovation or the intervention is at the expense of the how. Um, and of course, it's really important about, to talk about the what, the, the kind of very premise of this workshop is that there's been positive changes and we should work to identify them and make sure that they're not lost. And, and in order to do that, we need to talk about what those changes were. But if we do that with too much of an intervention focused lens, we risk losing the opportunity to have the really important conversations about the conditions that enabled people and systems to adapt and improve. Coming up with lists of interventions in and of itself will not help us to understand how to implement those interventions at scale. 
To take virtual consultations, for example, it's really important for us to capture information about what has been implemented, the technical systems and specific processes. But we also need to understand how it has been implemented successfully. We've been doing some work in, in queue over recent months, um, working with a number of members. We've highlighted some of the conditions that are needed um, to make that work. And they've drawn out things like the need to adapt clinical outcome measures, the need to make changes to roles, to invest in and develop new skills. In many instances, it's required cultural and leadership change. And it will again, as we try to think about how to maintain those remote consultations in a changed environment. And we don't have quite that same impetus as we did in the very early days. The third one I'd like to talk about is um, sort of top down, bottom up um, uh, kind of narrative. And we've started to notice um, perhaps a slight simplification in some of the narrative about autonomy and permission and control. Undoubtedly, some people experienced increased autonomy and local decision making and a move towards a really permissive culture during the height of the pandemic. And when we're thinking about the conditions that we want to um, maintain to allow innovation to flourish, it'll be really important to build on that. It's also clear that um, some people have experienced this reducing just in recent weeks, um, with this perceiving, people perceiving this to be a reassertion of control, whether that's um, perceived to come from kind of national government or local leaders or people's own managers, um, so to speak. And there's a risk in there that we create a kind of simple bottom up versus top down story. When in fact, we know that each part of the system has a role to play. And the question that we need to, ask, to ask ourselves is what is that role? What is the appropriate space for different people and organisations to be operating in? And what can the pandemic teach us about that? So where do national bodies come into their own? And where does local clinical leadership come into its own? Um, and it feels like we need to continue to create spaces where each part of the system can have honest conversations about what COVID showed us about our strengths and about the strengths of others. I'd like to just pause now and invite some of your thoughts on the questions of a kind of risk that we want to avoid. And this is going to be, again, fairly fast paced. Um, and for this, for those of you who um, uh, are able to and would happy to, we're going to use um, Slido. Um, so in order to access Slido, you just enter this um, www.slido.com into a mobile uh, device or, or to another tab on your laptop. Um, and then when you get there, it will ask you for a code. So if you pop in the code rapid QI um, and then you'll see a series of questions come up. If you have problems with this, technically you um, will put the questions in chat so you can use that. But if you're able to find this, um, that will be great. I'll just give you a moment um, to find that, um, find that site. Lovely. Great. So, um, so we didn't say they would be easy questions, um, but you know, don't, don't overthink it, I guess, just your reflections from today. Um, in trying to lock in the positive changes, one of the key risks for the health and care sector is to share your thoughts there. You can see they're starting to come up on the stream. You can still keep answering it. Brilliant. People have been answering. We will, um, uh, again, we'll, we'll capture these, these uh, findings and we'll include this in the write-up so people can see um, the kind of collective sense of what we think the, the key risks are for, for the sector. Mm. You can see in a few of those messages that are coming up, there's something about the patient voice and making sure that we are um, bringing that in, something about only locking in the things that are actually positive, talked a little bit about that, what data are we capturing, and some questions coming through on chat as well. Brilliant. Um, I'll just give it a second and then we'll move on to the next one. Mm. Mm. 
Great, Sarah. Um, if you could move on to the next question, that would be that would be great if people could finish off their answers. Lovely. So the next question then is um, kind of looking inwards a little bit. So you know, share what you're happy to. Um, uh, I believe this is a safe space, but um, share only what you're happy to. Really thinking about kind of myself. Um, and in my own leadership, what, what is it that you want to avoid, a risk that you might see, um, see for you? Mm. People being really open and honest there, sharing some of the things that they're, they're thinking about in their own leadership and roles. Wonderful, thank you. And we'll move on to the final, final question, which is a very quick fire. Um, um, final question. Catch up, lovely. So this is just, um, uh, I'll create something pretty at its very best, just using one word. The health and care system is. I hope somebody will take a picture of this uh, inspiring uh, cloud and we can get that on Twitter because it's, it's very true, isn't it? Lovely. Thank you so much. We'll, um, we'll draw that to a close now here, coming um, to the last, last couple of minutes. But thank you for participating in, in that. Um, it's really, really great to see, to see your responses. Um, and, and yeah, a lovely, lovely way to, to finish um, with some, some uh, really great words there about the health and care system. Great. Well, we are pretty much um, at the close. If I could ask you just to, if for those of you who can stay on for one minute, that would be much appreciated. Um, we would love to get your feedback on this session. We have one more session that we're going to run very quickly. If you could um, share your thoughts about um, things that went well. So www, what went well and what would be even better. Um, and I'm also going to launch a poll to ask you to just very quickly rate this webinar if you would be happy to. Um, to give us some feedback that will help us shape, um, help us shape the next um, next webinar that we will be running in August time. So I'll leave you just for a few moments to say that, and then for those of you who will stay on, who can stay on, I'll say just a few words about next steps and um, where you can find the write up and so on and so forth um, before we before we draw to a close. Thank you. I will then, um, I'll leave that running. So please do continue to vote or um, 
or share your reflections of what went well or even better but i'll um start talking and share some of the next steps with um with you also um sarah if you could move to the next slide um so we will, as I've mentioned a couple of times, we'll be sharing a write-up of today's session that will include the slides that we use, some video snippets, um, and some of the analysis from the content that you've shared with us. Um, so we'll get that, um, get that done as quickly as we can in the next couple of weeks, and we'll um, make that available on our website and email out to, um, to everybody. Please do um, feel free to use, use Twitter um, uh, if you'd like to share your reflections or, or make new connections with people that you might have met during today's session um, and use hashtag NHS Reset. We do have um, another workshop planned in a few weeks time. So if you would like to, if you found today helpful and you would like to join, please do join us. And um, that'll be next, uh, not next Friday. <laughs> uh, that would be a bit much. Um, Friday the 7th of um, August. Um, again, we'll be tweeting about that. And if you've got thoughts about content that you would like us to cover, please feel free to, um, to um, drop us a line on Twitter or, or um, through the website. Um, and you can get in touch if you've got any specific feedback that you'd like to at the email address there. So I will draw us to a close now. Thank you so much to um, our partners, NHS Confed and the HSN Network for, um, for running this webinar with us today and for creating this opportunity. And thank you most of all to everybody who's joined and given up their really valuable time and contributed um, so fully as, as always. Um, thank you very much. Have a good afternoon and we hope to see you again soon.